Hi, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us. I'm Sarah Blaskovich. I'm the food writer for the Dallas Morning News. Uh, and I have two awesome people who are going to engage in a delicious discussion today about barbecue. Guys, if you'll turn your uh, sound and video on, I'd love to introduce each of you. Um, we're going to talk about smoked meat today, and we're going to give you some tips, and we're going to let you ask questions. Um, I would like to introduce our two panelists. We have Joe Zavala of Zavala's Barbecue. Uh, Joe owns Zavala's in Grand Prairie with his wife, Kristen, and they've been smoking meat since 2019 and were listed on Texas Monthly's top 50 best barbecue joints. Uh, that's the gold standard for barbecue restaurants in the state. It is a list that I use and I think a lot of people listening use too. Um, Joe has some beloved menu items that I want him to talk about, some stuff at Zavala's that you can't find elsewhere. Uh, a fun fact about his building is that he managed to get the road near Zavala is renamed as Brisket Lane, which I think is a hilarious marketing tool and also a street that uh, I would really like to live on too, Joe. <laughs> um, Joe, we're so glad you're here. Tell us a couple more things about you. Yeah, you know, I'm born and raised in Grand Prairie. Um, I, uh, actually, my parents lived three minutes away from the shop. Uh, and in high school, actually since middle school, I played the cello all the way through high school. If I had a cello to play right now, probably couldn't do it, but it's a fun Yeah, thing. orchestra kid, I love it. Yeah. Good. We're glad you're here. Um, and our other panelist, Lane Milne, is one of five owners of Goldie's Barbecue in Fort Worth. It was named, named the number one barbecue joint by Texas Monthly and is therefore easily the most sought after barbecue restaurant, certainly in the state, but I would say in the country as well. Um, before Texas Monthly declared it so great, I have to say I visited in February 2021 and kind of lost my mind over this restaurant. I thought, why haven't we said more about this place? Um, I was totally in love with the homemade brioche bread that Lane and his friends make. Um, I was very intrigued by the odd and interesting sausages they were making. I thought the brisket was um, as good as any I'd had in the region and in the whole state. So um, the the accolade that Goldie's is the best in the state is is certainly earned. And if you haven't been out there, it's probably because they have very long lines right now. Um, they've actually been open since 2020. Uh, which, Lane, you can tell us later, is probably a pretty bad time to open a restaurant. It was a, that was a wacky year. Um, but we're going to get into the business of barbecue and the food in just a second. Lane, what else should we know about you? Um, I also was born and raised in Fort Worth, and I also used to play cello in high school. What? Yeah. yeah. So, well, All right. So there's going to be a band put together after this, and we're going to get you two and any of the other orchestra and band kids I played the flute, but I don't think that fits. Um, <laughs> oh, there, there is something about music people though. I feel like there's a there's a creative piece of both of you that probably maybe sparks your culinary journey. That is a hilarious thing. <laughs> <laughs> well, cool, Lane. Um, I'm so glad you're here. To, and then uh, I want to introduce who's sitting next to Lane. This is Chelsea. She works for Benny Keith. She just happens to be at Goldie's, which, which is where Lane is sitting right now um, at the restaurant. She sells a bunch of stuff. Um, to Joe, she sells to you too, right? Yes. Yeah. Okay. So Chelsea, tell us your role in the barbecue world in North Texas. So I work for Benny Keith Foods, broadline distributor, and I, I sell food. I sell chemicals. I sell whatever they need. We've got it or we'll find it. Um, roles have kind of shifted, you know, since 2020 into not just selling, but being more of a consultant. So that's what I try to do. That's awesome. Okay, so both of you guys, you have condiments that come from her. You have briskets and turkeys and vegetables and everything else that you buy some of that stuff from her. So it was just a coincidence that Chelsea was around. But when we talk about prices, uh, which I want to talk about in a little bit, anybody listening knows that eating barbecue has never been more expensive. And we want to get into why that is and uh, what might change and not change about that. And so Chelsea, if you'll stick around, I just would love to for your brain a little bit with some of those questions. Um, a couple of housekeeping things before we get into the questions for our pitmasters. Uh, please use the Q&A button on this chat to ask us questions. Um, if you're watching on Facebook, we're also checking it out over there so you can ask questions over there and they will make it to this live stream. Um, for anybody who has to skip out or who wants to watch this later, um, this video in full will be posted on all of our social media platforms and I'll also post it on my personal Twitter, that's S Blaskovich. 
Um, so follow along. If you got to dip out, that's okay. Also, it's lunchtime and we're talking about food. So I would love it if everybody would be eating while the three of us are talking. I'm always the person on the Zoom call who happens to bring my lunch during the lunch hour when nobody else does. So please be that person listening who's actually eating because uh, it's, it's, uh, it's what we all do and all love. Um, okay, so we'll start with just a couple of getting to know you questions, guys, and then we'll um, we'll talk about the business of barbecue. So, um, Lane, we'll start with you. What got you interested in barbecue, and what's what's your sort of barbecue origin story? Um, so we all moved down to Austin, and probably like 2013, and then uh, we had barbecue for the first time, and we really liked it. So we just started going around Texas trying spots, and then eventually cooking it at home, and then working at barbecue places, and then saved up the money to open up our own spot. Uh-huh, and if I can interject, when he says they worked at some barbecue places, between Lane and his four buddies, they worked at almost every excellent barbecue place I could name in the Austin area, and I'm not kidding. Um, can you name just a couple of them, Lane? I don't wanna be wrong, but tell us tell us where you and your friends have worked. Yeah, I worked at Micklewaite's Craft Meats in a place called Friedman's. Um, Johnny and Dylan worked at La Barbecue. Johnny worked at Valentina's. Um, and then Jalen also worked at Friedman's. Uh-huh. Yeah, so I think uh, you guys are some of the youngest group of pit masters, especially on the Texas monthly list, but also just doing important things in Texas. But it's, it's fascinating that if five of you spend a couple years working at literally the state's best places and then all come together to serve barbecue, clearly it's working. So. Um, Age is just a number, right? If you've got five people who've worked at all those spots, it's it's inspiring, Lane. Um, Joe, what got you into barbecue? Yeah, so growing up, uh, my family, our family vacation was going down to South Texas and going down there for every quinceanera or wedding or funeral. My dad was always cooking. And then back in the 90s, it was great when the Cowboys were winning, right? We're the house to everybody. <laughs> and uh, my dad was always cooking so um in 2015 we bought our house and i wanted that same feeling and having my friends come over i started cooking i made a brisket on fourth of july of 2015 everybody said it was great my best friend said it was the worst thing he ever had then i became obsessed with it trying to figure out how to make a good brisket and then in 2016 uh january 2016 until the wife we need to pay off our student loans so let's do pre-orders only through social media there's no like risk and uh that's how we got started uh-huh so does your best friend like your food now? Um, it's my best friend, CJ. So he does like uh, all the cooking videos that we're in. He's on there. Uh, he's <laughs> yeah. Food, but, uh, you know, he's, uh, he keeps me humbled. Yeah, right. Tough sell, TJ. Um, that's funny. Uh, okay. At both of your restaurants, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, you're inspired by Central Texas style barbecue. So um, I'll have you explain a little bit of what that means for your staples, like your brisket. Um, but each of you do really interesting things beyond that. Um, Lane, I'm inspired by the sausage that you make. Joe, uh, I like a lot of the tacos and the, the sort of Mexican flair that you've got on your menus. So I want you to both just tell anybody who hasn't been to your place, what are your top sellers, both um, the traditional barbecue and the non-traditional barbecue. Joe, we'll start with you. Yeah, I think we're known for our sloppy wine. It's uh, okay. a play on Jordan Jackson uh, out in uh, Long Green when he was at Bodacious. So he had the sloppy okay. Joe. And it was a way because we're always getting judged on how our barbecue looks. So every slice has to look good for the gram. So there's some slices that doesn't look good. So we had to figure out how do we still sell that. So we chop it up, mix it with barbecue sauce and pulled pork, put it in on tortilla. And, you know, it's five bucks and it's almost close to half a pound. I, I consider it like the, co or the Costco hot dog, right? It's like something that, I don't ever want to change the price. It helps us get rid of the food and make sure people get really good food, a great taco. Like the people that have been there for a long time, they know to order two extra tortillas so they can make three tacos out of it. Yeah. Um, and then, you know, we really just try to have sauces and pico de gallo because this is something about throwing any kind of piece of meat on a fresh tortilla with pico and salsa really goes a long way. So that's something that we really try to, you know, encourage people to do when they come into uh, Zavala's. Yeah, and we see a little bit of that or a medium amount of that in Texas, Joe, but it still is different than the Central Texas style, you know, to have a little bit of verde sauce on the table or to have um, a lot of places have tortillas now, but not all of them because the, the traditional Texas way is that slab of white bread. Um, so it's it's great to see you taking, you know, sort of your background and then taking food seriously and infusing that with your barbecue. Um, speaking of bread, Lane, you guys make your own brioche, yeah. which you don't have to do because the barbecue is good enough on its own. 
Um, talk a little about the brioche because I think that's your love child. And then what else you guys do that's interesting? Yeah, so usually we'll shape the bread, we'll bulk rise it for like a day or two, like, and then cold ferment it. And then after that, we'll shape it and then cold ferment it again. So it gets a lot of really bready flavor. Um, other than that, it's pretty simple. We'll just flour, salt, sugar, butter, yeast, milk. Yeah, pretty straightforward stuff. But nobody else is doing that, Lane. Why are you guys doing that? Um, we tried to make everything as good as possible. So that way it wasn't just like, oh, you just go there to get like one thing. We wanted everything on the tray to be equally as good and equally amazing. Um, so we figured we have to make bread to do that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, what else do you think makes Goldie's different? Talk about the sausage a little bit. Yeah, I think we make all of our sausage from scratch. It's all beef right now. Um, usually, we haven't done it lately, but usually you're on specials. Uh, so like we'll do a Lao sausage. We used to do a different one every week. Uh, we did a hatch sausage probably a couple weeks ago. Yeah. And then we'll probably do like a jalapeno cheese again, which used to be on the menu every day. It's um, a good one. Yeah, we'll probably do that soon. But other than that, right now, it's just like our house sausage. And it's pretty straightforward, just like mustard seed, beef, garlic, onion, pepper. And for each of you, is brisket number one, if you had to pick a number one uh, top seller? Unfortunately, it is our top seller. Unfortunately, why? You know, it's just, the, like, I, I feel terrible what we have to charge for brisket, but we're, you know, it's, it's an ongoing story, right? It's like, all right, the guys are charging steakhouse prices. Like, I get it. Like, it, it hurts us to do it, but pepper's expensive. Like, it's, like, every single thing that goes into the brisket. That's why, like, why we really try to, you know, have turkey, have sausages, have pork ribs, pulled pork, other things um, to offset the brisket. But, you know, we're in Texas. Everybody wants brisket. So it's also figuring out how do you do brisket sandwiches or brisket tacos or the sloppy wands or brisket poppers or brisket boudin, like different things to make sure that the brisket goes further. So people are still able to get that fix that they want. That's at brisket in Texas. Yeah, good. Lane, is brisket number one for you? Yeah, briskets are top seller. <laughs> Yeah, and, and I should say I eat a lot of brisket around this state. The brisket at both of these restaurants is really good. Um, but if you if you think about the business behind the restaurant, you know, to Joe's point, you gotta you gotta figure out how to take that now expensive cut, which I you know we should all also remember. Brisket used to be the worst part of the cow. It was it was inexpensive. You'd cook it forever in a crock pot or whatever because it was just. You didn't really, that was an undesirable cut compared to, you know, the filet and all the other stuff. So I just find it ironic and frustrating and alluring that, you know, we, we've made it into uh, our state's uh, most interesting piece of meat, in my opinion, but it's also now super pricey. Well, yes. And then you have Arby's and others that uh, want this. <laughs> Arby's, yeah. I didn't know we were going to toss in Arby's in a barbecue round table. I like it. <clears throat> um, <clears throat> excuse me. Uh, okay, let's talk about <clears throat> pricing because we've gotten into this a little bit. And Joe, you mentioned you hate what you have to charge for brisket. It's not fun for restaurant owners to not only make less money themselves, but know that they have to pass on the price to the consumer. Um, but we've watched restaurants fail for the last couple of years over not doing this. So as I understand, you, you either, as, as prices rise, which has nothing to do with you and your business and how you're running it, you either have to raise your prices as well uh, or take a significant cut yourself or close. Um, so consumers, barbecue will be more expensive. I know we've all gone to a great place. You always order more than you need to and $75 later, you know, you've got some meat and some sides. Um, so Chelsea, let me ask you first, What's the deal with that? Are we seeing rising prices across all cuts of meat? Um, or is there is there a worse one than others? Not necessarily. Um, the, the biggest jump right now is turkey. So when you see prices go up, that typically indicates that the supply is tight, right? So it's all about supply and demand. And unfortunately with turkey, the bird flu earlier this year wiped out millions, tens of millions of turkeys. And so the availability and the price right now on turkeys is extremely high with 
both Joe and Lane, I went to them and I said, listen, from what you were paying a year ago to what you're paying now, your turkey has went up over a dollar a pound, you know, and, and they adjusted accordingly. And now the conversation that I came here to tell Lane and that I had with Joe this morning. <laughs> and then you joined a food and, and now live cast about it. <laughs> nice to meet you. Um, was that turkey, the turkey specifically that they use, we can't get it. So, and it's, it's nothing on our end. This all comes from the turkey suppliers. You know, they don't, they don't have the birds to ship and we're talking turkey breasts, legs, wings, whole birds. So they're working on a shift right now of how, how we can make that change. Yeah. Okay. So uh, for anybody just joining us, watching on Facebook um, or joining us on this Zoom call, we are talking about barbecue and the delicious things about it. Right now we're talking about uh, what could be a really tricky Thanksgiving um, because it sounds like turkeys are going to be very expensive and that there are fewer of them in general. Um, and so, Joe, what do, what do we do if we can't buy smoked turkey either? If, we can't buy, you know, raw turkey from the grocery store or let's say we're the kind of people who buy it from a barbecue place because we got too many other things to do on Thanksgiving. Like what now? Yeah, you know, like I was joking with Chelsea this morning that we're probably just going to shut down the whole week because it's all around <laughs> and the turkey. She gave us some alternatives like prime rib, like it may be a prime rib Thanksgiving or, you know, some That's people, kind of a fancy twist. That could be fun. And some people actually love briskets and people want to do something different than the turkey. But, you know, it's just one of those things. I'm a traditionalist and I want a turkey. So I was asking yeah. uh, Chelsea if she's going to be able to sneak some in for us. And she's like, I'm sorry, like we can't do that at all. So. It's gonna be really interesting. I think maybe, you know, maybe a Tex-Mex uh, Thanksgiving, uh, you know, I have to. Yeah, that's fun. Yeah, you have to get creative in times when when it's just gonna price people out. Cause you also think of the average family that's just gonna buy a turkey from the grocery, but it needs to be a fair price. Cause they're, you know, let's say they're feeding 10 people or 20 people, depending on how big their Thanksgiving is. This could, yeah, I, I imagine there's going to be news stories coming from people like me and our retail writer um, about this very topic. Now, Lane, what do you think when it comes to turkey? If if you have fewer turkeys, what do we do? What do you make that could be Thanksgiving instead? Um, we haven't thought about Thanksgiving yet, but we'll probably put smoked chicken on the menu. Uh -huh. um, we have a couple of tips and tips and uh, what's the word? Tips tricks. and tricks uh, to <laughs> make it pretty good. So we're excited to mess around with it, and um, we're excited to do something different. It'll be more fun for us. So we're not too upset right now. But we do love smoked turkey. Yeah, I mean, I guess if you're into the bird, you could switch to the other bird. Mm -hmm. um, but that's yeah, that's going to be an odd Thanksgiving. Um, now, in general, when it comes to prices, Joe and Lane, either of you can answer this. Are you finding that across the board everything is more expensive, or are you is there a is there a worse thing beyond turkey? I think it's uh, not just food. I think it's our to-go packaging. It's our mm -hmm. food. It's our um, paper towels. Like I had to ask uh, Chelsea to send us all our compare prices from year to date. I think it was the beginning of August to uh, last August. And I think the lowest thing that uh, rose was like 30%. And because I was looking at my food costs and I'm just like, okay, where can we cut costs? And there was really nowhere. So we just had to pass it on to the consumers as much as we didn't want to. Um, you know, we just try to go as furthest as we can before we pass those uh, costs on. But, you know, even... You know, before the pandemic, we never charged for tortillas. Now we have to charge for tortillas. We yeah we charge for extra salsas. We're like, yeah, here's extra salsa. But you know, spending you know close to two three thousand dollars on salsa uh, ingredients a month, like it adds up. So it's like, all right, you know, like yes, you can get like the first couple, and then we have to charge you for the next. It, it, it's just something about you know have to run a business and want to make sure that we can still be here next year, right? So we have to make sure that we're a viable business. Yep. And then you also want to be the place that sells good enough tortillas that people who buy them feel they're worth it. You know, I mean, if, if I, I've felt forever that if the food is good enough, it's worth paying for. If the news stories are good enough, they're worth paying for, right? Like it has to be, it has to be a model where it, you know, you're not giving a middling product for a high price. And I think, I think you just said something that, yes, every single day it's education to our customers of what we're serving them, what our product is. Like we utilize 44 farm beef out of Cameron, Texas. Yeah. We make sure that we educate people that, you know, you're getting the best beef possible and that's why you're paying a premium. 
Uh, and also like with all of our sauces, you know, it's all fresh ingredients or raw. We're making it in-house. So there's that love that goes into it. Yeah, good. I have one more economic question. Chelsea, I think this might be for you, but anybody hop in. Um, somebody who's watching David Watkins says, as ranchers are forced to reduce their herds due to cost of hay and feed, will we see a drop in prices of brisket? That's a good question. And I wish I had the answer to tell you accurately. I think there's so much that goes into it. It's not just, I mean, obviously it, it starts with the ranch, right? And the feed and not only that, but what is the cost of fertilizer to grow the feed? What is fuel, you know, what, what's it costing them to get it to elevators and get it sold? Um, but not only that, when it gets to the packing plant too, the increased cost of wages to even find employment to work in these plants. Um, so there's there's a million yeah. steps before it gets to your trays at Zavala's or Goldie's as to why the prices are affected. And people have to remember there's only so many briskets per cow, right? It's, it's not like ground feed. So that's also going to take effect into, you know, the animals that are being slaughtered and their growth, you know, are people reducing their herds? Is that is that going to be an effect that we see several months from now or years from now, depending on, you know, growth rates? So there's a lot of factors that go into it. It's it's not as easy as, you know, the price is really good one week and then really bad the next. It's it's a whole bundle of all of those things. Mm hmm. Yeah, there's a there's a professor at Texas A&M. His name is Dr. Anderson, and he works in the meat science department. And he's somebody I have used as an expert for this topic. He's a he's a meat science economist. And so he has all these graphs about how many head of cattle and, you know, what happened 20 years ago all the way through today. Um, so he might be the best forecaster in the state for this kind of thing. But um it's complicated and I think it's I think it's fair to say that eating barbecue is not an inexpensive hobby anymore. Um, and I want to talk a little bit with you both about the hobby of making barbecue at home. So we're not coming to your two restaurants where we knew the food is good and, and consistent. We're going to try to make it at home, which I can speak from personal experience is both risky and expensive. You know, you buy a 12 pound brisket for however much and you turn that thing into a rock in the backyard. That's a bummer when you're then buying Domino's pizza delivery that night, thinking that you were going to feed, you know, 20 of your best friends during the football game. Uh, so we, my husband and I like to make a lot of barbecue. We like to go to a lot of football tailgates. Some of it is good. Some of it is great. A fair amount of it isn't. Um, and so uh, can you give us some tips? Let's talk briskets first. Um, Joe, you told me once, and I will never forget it. You said uh, you can Google how to make a brisket and you can get 90% of the way there. But it's that last 10 percent that turns my brisket into something that's not restaurant worthy or is restaurant worthy uh, brisket specifically give us give us a couple tips on that last 10 percent i think it's a rest you know a lot of people uh they plan their day out because they want to make sure the food's done at seven o'clock so they can feed everybody so they're like trying to rush it because the timeline never works out right so yeah. it's all always try to explain to people like it's okay for the brisket to be done eight, 10 hours beforehand. You can rest it and it's going to be totally like, it's going to be better. Like I truly feel the longer the rest, uh, the better the brisket. Um, but I, I definitely think it's that. And also, you know, like we can give you like the thing about it is like you can Google, you can learn everything you want and you're going to be able to get there, but you like actually doing it, like the different elements of the weather, the temperature, the moisture, like that's that, difference that you just like learn by making a lot of mistakes on uh, what to do. Yeah, and making a lot of notes, right? I remember hearing Aaron Franklin talk and he is, I, I think maybe everybody's this way now, but it, he was the first person I'd heard be so obsessive about where the heat spots in the smoker were and about exactly how long it took and what, you know, there's, there's an hour or a half hour log every day um, for all of those briskets. And so if you do that for however many years, you learn pretty good about how it works. If you do it for two football games a season, you know, so twice a year, you could go 10 years and still make some pretty bad briskets if you haven't taken copious notes. Or if you maybe like me has had a bunch of beers while you're doing it, you know, cause like this is your business. And so somebody works in the middle of the night to make all that food for me, the customer, when I show up, I think a lot of amateur cooks, even ones who are serious about it, 
are you up in the middle of the night? You need to be, you know, are you drinking too much beer and not paying enough attention and not making notes? You need to be, uh, it sounds like. Um, so uh, Lane, what do you think? What are some other things that brisket enthusiasts should know as they're trying to cook at home? I would keep it really simple. Um, don't overthink it and then uh, just relax. Cause even if it comes out bad, people will still love it. Um, I would say don't like read something and be like, oh, I have to do it this way because somebody told me that, you know, it's going to be different for you. It's going to be different on the smokers. And then uh, don't overthink it. Just take your time. Don't rush the wrap just because you see somebody wrap. Let it rest and then slice it right. And it should be looking pretty solid. Can you give us some high level thoughts on the seasoning that goes on the brisket? You know, are we salt, pepper only? Do you do the mustard slather? And if you do that, can you explain to anybody who hasn't tried it? Like, you don't need to give us your recipes, but what, what goes on the outside of a brisket? So I wouldn't really worry about the slather unless you're trimming ahead of time. If you're just okay. taking it right out of the package, it'll be wet enough for the rub the stick. Okay. And as far as seasoning goes, like as long as you have salt and pepper and put enough on there, it's gonna taste good. You can put more stuff on there, but then you kind of, get in a risky territory where you might mess it up. As okay. far as what we use right now, slather wise, we just use water. Um, and then seasoning wise, we use our house made seasoning salt, 16 mesh pepper, and then some table salt. Okay. And you make your own seasoning salt. So yeah. you cook down, I don't know, onions and other stuff and make it into a powder? No, not we don't go that far. Maybe <laughs> one day, but it's pretty much just a mix of spices. So it's like okay. garlic, onion, it. turmeric, sugar, paprika, nothing yeah. crazy. Okay, but at Goldie's, we're hearing it's it's not salt and pepper only. You're you're giving a little bit more personality to the rub on the outside of that brisket. Yeah, I love that. That seems in line with some of your other food too. You know, with the sausage being just a little more, um, not chefy, but a, a little bit more, you know, culinarily um, adventurous, maybe. Yeah, we like to have fun with it, and like we don't hold ourselves like a strict way of this is how we have to do it. We're constantly changing things, trying to make it better, trying to make it the best we can. Yeah, Lane, somebody asks, what kind of pepper do you use? Uh, so we get it from Fiesta. We used to get it from Southern Style Spices. I think from Southern Style Spices, we use a 16 mesh. Now I think it's a 12 mesh from Fiesta. I think they're like sizes are slightly different. And then the one at Fiesta is like slightly more peppery than the one we used to get from Southern Style Spices. Which, which you like better? Yeah, we like a little bit of pepper on there. Yeah, okay, good. Joe, what do you think? So uh, because we're seasoning outside in the wintertime, we do have to use some kind of slather. So we use uh, Tabasco Chipotle uh, mixed with water um, during the wintertime. Just mm. to it. But during the summertime, it sweats, so everything will stick on it. We actually use four cups of 12 mesh uh, black pepper. So we use really thick black pepper to one cup of kosher salt, very yeah. uh, pepper forward. And we try to cover the brisket completely up top in the sides where you don't, you're not able to see the meat. On the bottom, we barely put any seasoning because it's gonna fall off anyways. So you really get a really thick bark uh, from all that 12 mesh black pepper that we use. And it actually mellows out um, with all the smoke that goes into it. Mm -hmm. Good tips. For anybody who's just joining us or, or circling back, that um, Joe just told you how to make his briskets. That's pretty awesome. I, I bet his are still better at his restaurant, but you could you could test him and try it yourself. Anybody who's listening and wants to do that at home. Uh, go good, on. okay. Um, another question from Andy. After the brisket rests, how do you maintain a nice, thick, crispy bark? So I'm, I cheat a little bit because I want our briskets to be done quicker. So we actually wrap in foil uh, for the last part of the cook and crank up the heat. But in not in pink paper or butcher paper. Well, yeah, we okay. wrap oil, crank up the heat to finish the cook off um, and get it nice and tender. And right after it's done, we pull it off and then we do wrap it in butcher paper to bring that bark back. And we let it cool down for about an hour or two hours during the summertime. Uh, winter time is probably like 30 to 45 minutes because it's so cold outside. And yeah. then we're going to the warmer, go to sleep for uh, nighttime. Aha. Uh -huh. Okay. Lane, do you do that a little differently? Yeah, so we don't wrap until the briskets are done. But as oh. far as like, trying to maintain a crispier bark, I would probably let it rest uncovered before you slice it so that way it doesn't steam. Or if you rested, if you wrapped it and you're resting it and you want it crispier, you could throw it back on the pit for a little bit to let it firm back up. Um, but as far as it's staying crispy, like in the paper or foil, it's kind of tricky. 
but I think unwrapped is probably your best bet. Mm -hmm. Okay, good. And I want to go back. There's a question, uh, a big sort of picture question. Um, what temp and how long do you smoke or cook a brisket? You both could write a book on this, so I'm not really going to ask you to talk through that, but can we do big generalizations? Do you do an hour per pound in the smoker about? We use uh, small briskets uh, after trimmed. It's probably between 10 to 12 pounds. Okay. Typically, uh, typically our briskets go unwrapped for about nine to 10 hours. And then we wrap it for two to three hours. Winter time, it goes a little longer because it just needs more heat to do it. Um, so, you know, so yeah, it comes out to about a pound, pound or, or an hour, hour 15 a pound. Yeah. Okay. So you're, you're cooking a 12 pound brisket. You're, you're cooking for at least 12 hours and that's hands on time, not sleeping. Not sleeping. Yeah. Lane, is that about, is that a fair generalization? So we kind of start ours a little lower and just gradually bring it up. And as the brisket gets hotter, we bump up the temperature. So we'll start off around 200 and finish around 300. And we like getting mm -hmm. the higher heat because it helps make the fat cap really rendered and that helps make it mm -hmm. taste really good. But as and what it's probably 10 hours on a good day, 14 hours on a day where I'm like, oh, I want to go home. <laughs> Yeah, of course. Um, <laughs> what kind of smokers do each of you use, Lane? Uh, we have a mill scale, and then I think I'm saying it right, but it's an MM barbecue company rotisserie thing, yeah. and we use that for the pork ribs. Mm -hmm. Okay, Joe? So we have two El Cucarachas, we have one AJ, and then we just got a mill scale back in April. Aha. Interesting that neither of you use just like all the same stuff. Yeah, and, uh, you know, it makes it fun, right? Because you have to, every pit's different. So uh, you got to make it complicated because why do you want to make it simple? Yeah, I mean, I feel like that's why all these people are listening to this chat really is like, if it were easy, if this were, you know, just making a bowl of macaroni and cheese every morning, there, you know, there's, there's not like, I don't think it would be near as exciting as if, you know, you knew that you could fail at any time or that your, even your mechanism, your fire could not be hot enough. You could have a hot spot in your smoker that you don't know is there until you mess it up. Or, you know, that's, like that's fun. For example, uh, Lane just got us connected with a person who comes, cleans our pits and our stack hasn't been cleaned in a while. And he's like, man, there was so much soot in there. So jokingly, I'm like, all the teams got to relearn how to use the smokers because it's just going to flow so much better. So it's just like one of those things like, yeah. well, you don't know what's going to happen this week. Yeah, that's good. Um, Joe, Jeff Helm, who's listening, uh, just wants to say that he loves how he can smell the smoke throughout downtown Grand Prairie. He doesn't live far from Zavala's. So if anybody's down in, in Grand Prairie or driving down Dick Price Road where Goldie's is, um, you start to smell that smoke. And um, for me, someone who travels anywhere for barbecue, and uh, th that's like happiness in a smell, right? And then if you're standing in line at either of your places, which I have done a lot at both of your places, and I think many people listening have too, at least you got that like good smoke smell as you think, you know, someday I will eat your food as you stand. I mean, often we stand in the heat, right? <laughs> That's what it means to be a Texas barbecue fan is to stand outside in the heat and wait for hot food that you would then eat outside in the heat. But you gotta have or like gluttons for punishment. That's what um, I want to ask each of you your best and your busiest days. So those are two things, best and worst, right? Best day to come, worst day to come when it comes to standing in line. Wayne? I think Saturday is probably the busiest day. Um, and then Sunday, now that like football is going on, I think that'll be maybe a more mellow day. Um, but as far as like, there aren't people getting here quite as early. Like every once in a while, a few people get here super early. But if you get here around nine, like, we have the whole, most of the line shaded and it's not that bad. We have waters, we have chairs outside. So it's kind of nice out there. You get to watch everyone cook all the barbecue. Totally. And you both open at 11, right? Yeah. Okay. And then Joe, tell us your hours are funny. Tell us what days you're open and, and when we yeah, should go. So, uh, we are open Thursday, Friday, Saturday from 11 to four, but we're back in October. We're going to bring back the heat tonight. Uh, so we'll be open later on Thursday and Fridays. Um, and then the wife runs a coffee shop Tuesday through Saturday from 6 a.m. to 11 a.m. where we have breakfast tacos and uh, coffee, and, uh, uh, brisket and other smoked meats for the breakfast tacos. Yeah, Joe, a really smart way to use a space and it got too popular. So now you're building her her own coffee shop behind the restaurant. But 
you know, breakfast tacos, some with barbecue, which, which came from your business and coffee just makes so much sense on the days when you're not doing barbecue. It's, um, and I loved a story that Daniel Vaughn wrote recently about the coffee barbecue connection. Um, it makes sense to me that, that a place who cares so much about the craft of smoked meat might care so much about the craft of roasted coffee beans and then the craft of making the perfect cup of coffee or the perfect latte. It like those, those make sense together. And you are one example of lots of places in Texas that are getting into the coffee game. It's cool. Yeah, it's, uh, it's been a fun ride. Okay, and either of you can take this question. Explain for anybody uh, annoyed by the idea that you sell out of barbecue, right? Like, why can't you just be like Chili's to where if I want to go and get chicken crispers any time of day, you have them and I can have them right away. I, explain to me why that doesn't work. Uh, so our restaurant, we literally have no more space to cook any more food. And we usually go until we can't go anymore. Uh, we run out of, there's no line, we're out of food, we have no more smoker space. All the fridges are filled up. Our fridge fell over yesterday. <clears throat> oh no. <laughs> yeah, we had to saw out the back and we bought a new fridge. So we're literally maxed out on space and we're maxed out on electricity. Okay, is that the same answer for you, Joe? I know your kitchen is also tiny. Yeah, but you know, uh, you know, like uh, Chelsea knows, I just say yes to everything, right? That's why I, I just keep on buying smokers, like, and we just figure it out. Uh, but yeah, you know, it's one of those things. Uh, we, you know, unlike Goldie's, like, we don't have those long lines. Like, we're just steady lines. I would say eighty percent of our business is Grand Prairie, um, so we're really feeding our community, and that's why you know we try to expand outside of barbecue and do fajitas or do burgers that we're trying to bring back. Um, it's just because there's only so much barbecue people can eat. And uh, as much as I wish they would come all the time, like price, price is expensive, right? So do you have different alternatives for them to be able to have? Because you, know, you still got to have revenue coming in so we can pay our employees and you know, try to keep on growing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think I'll add, tell me if this is right too, that prices are high and you buy a certain number of briskets and smoke them that day. So you run out of briskets. It's not like, oh, let me go fry some in the back. You're like, I'll have some ready for you in 13 and a half hours. And we're not open in 13 and a half hours because that's middle of the night or whatever. So I think that's another just logistical piece of it that uh, maybe obvious if you've been around barbecue, but maybe not so is if, if there aren't smoked briskets ready, if the ribs take three or four hours, it's, it's that long until there's more. The Goldies just had a great video came up last Friday, I think, that really shows what it means that own a barbecue joint because like my team is at the restaurant right now trimming all our briskets and then tomorrow they're making all the sides and all the sauces right so then they can focus on cooking and serving thursday friday saturday um because if you were having to do all that stuff while you're cooking and serving there's just no way you can do it so they'll be up there for the next seven hours trimming all the briskets trimming all the ribs making all the sausage and uh in that video that that goldie's had it shows it perfectly mm -hmm. Um, I love it when when uh, restaurateurs talk about like like the hours put in to something, right? Like you know that slice of brisket was was a twenty four hour process or whatever it might have been. Um, if we think about food in that way, it could be more than twenty four hours. You know, by time the the meat made it where it was first, and then it came to you. I think that stuff is uh, really fascinating, and for people who love food like me, maybe it's a, a way to sort of um, appreciate you know, the people who cook food and, and the, the people who are doing a job that we don't do as well. Um, there, there are a couple of fun comments I just want to mention here, and then we'll go on to a new question. Katie O'Neill uh, just wants everyone to know that they should get over it if they don't like to stand in line and or uh, if you're sold out. So I, I like that attitude too. The waiting is sort of part of this love and hate of barbecue. It's, it's, it's a culture piece of it that I have lived intimately. And it sounds like Katie has too. Um, and then Philip B, uh, Philip B has a long last name, like my last name. He says, maybe the price of barbecue is not high enough. Uh, supply meets demand. So that's a, that's a plus I'll one say, for you guys. I'll say this about our line. And I think Lane will probably agree. I tell, I tell our team that this is literally an experience for them. So they want to have a conversation. Everybody gets a minute, 32 minutes. Like it, like I want to make sure that they feel this is the whole experience because we're starting to have people travel all through Texas, but we had somebody 
literally two weeks ago fly in from Florida, from Miami, Florida, just because they saw us on Instagram, eat, and we're flying back out. I'm like, yes, are you kidding me? And uh, she's like, no. And it was like the coolest thing ever. So it's like things like that. It's like that is a reason why we want to make sure everybody gets that full experience. And if they want to sit and have a conversation for a minute 30, we're going to have that conversation with them. Like, it's okay. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we're going to give every single person that opportunity. And then even like my team is all in myself. So always walking around, checking on everybody because people want to have the conversation and they want to go see the pits. Like it's all about the beginning to the end of the experience and the food just, you know, add a cherry on top. Yeah. And they want pictures with you and they want to tell you their barbecue success story. And it doesn't matter if you're not jazzed about it. You have to be. It's it's because they, they made from Miami, Florida. Oh my gosh, that person, Joe. Like, I feel like I should have been like, do you want to come to my house or something? Oh, I gave, my dog? I gave them stickers. I, and I was just like, holy cow. Like, this is just incredible. Like, I couldn't believe it. Um, okay, let's get off of brisket for just a second because somebody has a good question. Um, if, if they can't eat beef and you're going to give like a second favorite thing to either order at your restaurant or try to make it home. I don't know if those are the same question or not. Uh, what's, what's that non-beef recommendation? I love our turkey. That's the only thing my son eats. He eats turkey tacos. <laughs> He's sad because Chelsea took it, took it away from him. I don't know how my brother <laughs> <laughs> It's my son. We need to check in on your son in a minute and, you know, in two months and see how he's doing. <laughs> withdrawals are going to be bad. Yeah. Lane? I would say uh, Goldie's chicken this weekend. <laughs> I love it. And then buy it for Thanksgiving. Are, do you guys do a fair amount of like these large orders? You know, somebody who says, I want to have a party, but I don't want to make the food. Is that part of it? Me? Either. Yeah, both. Um, right now, we just do the line only. We're working on adding pre-orders soon. So we'll post on our Facebook and uh, Instagram whenever we do so. But it's probably maybe two weeks out. Oh, so, gosh. Okay, um, there's a tip. Uh, yeah, we'll do that around then, so. Joe, do you guys do pre-orders? Yeah, so I would say um, one complaint that we get is like the line. And so we always encourage people, hey, we actually do pre-orders. Um, and even, you know, pre-COVID, um, we're very, I would say majority, majority of our business was like 40% was pre-orders, funny enough. And then mm -hmm. COVID happened, you know, it's like a 80, 90% was pre-orders. And now it's back to, you know, probably about 20% of our business is uh, pre-orders. But, you know, we're starting to see a lot of uh, people going back to the office. So there's a lot of like office orders coming in and it's a great way for them to just come get the food and take it to the house or excuse me, to the office. And it works out really well. Yeah, that's great. Um, I want to read an off the wall comment. You guys, this is fun. Uh, barbecue people are the best. Um, Terry says, as a token of my appreciation for the great work Sarah is doing, I promise I did not plant this. All who are on this broadcast today can get a free slice of my brisket cheesecake at my restaurant, White Right Pizza in Frisco. But so we know who you are, you must tell the server, Sarah Blaskovich. <laughs> that's awesome. That's oh, that's hilarious. Um, okay, so if anybody wants brisket cheesecake, it's at White Right Pizza in Frisco if you say my full name today. Um, brisket cheesecake. Can we talk about this for a sec, guys? Have you made it? Have you had it? Do you want to? Brisket cheesecake or cheesecake? Yeah. Cheesecake. Cheesecake. Uh, I'll try everything once. Okay. But you haven't made it. Yeah. Lane? I've never had brisket cheesecake. I've had brisket donuts. I've had brisket pecan pie. Never cheesecake. Oh, yeah. Um, I have had brisket cheesecake. Actually, I ordered one for a family member's birthday, which is something that a food writer does for her poor family, I guess. Um, and it was actually pretty good because the cream cheese filling was not too sugary. So it was it was like you get that that tart sour cream cheese thing without a lot of the sugar. And then it had um, pickled, yes, pickled purple onions that you could put on the top. So you like get yourself a slice and it does have brisket in the cheesecake, but there was a little bit of the pickled purple onion on top. Um, and I, it was wildly rich, but I thought it was interesting. So I haven't tried white, right pizzas, brisket cheesecake, but um, I would. I try it once. Brisket makes everything better. Yeah, right? Um, okay, we've got a couple of questions. Uh, Aural Coors wants to know what kind of 
wood you use when you smoke your meat. You may use different for different uh, products, but go through it for us. Lane, if you'll go first. Yeah, we use post oak wood only right now. And we get yeah. it from Canada Woods. It's right down the street. It's uh, kiln dried. They measure it while they bake it out. So it's the exact same every time. And then uh, like which makes it. a difference. Yeah. We like the way uh, they cut it too, because it's more consistent. It's a really good size and we can build the fires really perfectly. <laughs> yeah. Okay. And you use post oak for everything. Yeah. Okay. It's Joe. So we do uh, post oak about 85% of the time. And then every 15% we throw a pecan in there just because I like how it smells. And that's what my dad used. But for mm -hmm. all of our uh, live fire grilling, we use mesquite. Ah, yeah. So you've got a little bit of a mix. Yeah, that's great. Um, somebody else was asking about, oh, somebody just asked me what beer am I drinking? This is Topo Chico, you guys. I wish I could tell you I was drinking beer on this. That would be like a, that would be a serious baller move as I'm working all day. It's just Topo. Although I'm proud of this, I found this in the suburbs. They do not have lime Topo at the grocery stores in Dallas proper that I can find, but I found this um up at a kroger in frisco and that's my hot tip of the day for a supply chain problem is he's about to open up right so you won't have any trouble probably yes and um speaking of that y'all stick with me uh next week i'm going to the barbecue restaurant in heb in frisco later this week and i'm going to write about it so as heb fans know they have a barbecue joint in them i've actually never eaten at any of them because the HEB shopping experience if you're in a city with one is so exciting that I've never thought to also eat barbecue. Um, I've heard mixed reviews on how serious the barbecue is, but I am certainly willing to give it a try. People say it's good. It's like the best chain barbecue, they say. I mean, that's that's actually high praise because chain barbecue is a, is a pretty big piece of the barbecue industry. It just may not be a huge piece of what a lot of people listening here are, are talking about if you know if you're a hobbyist or if you're somebody following texas monthly's list maybe you eat less chain barbecue but i think your average person eats a fair amount of it in texas um okay we've got you guys we have so many questions we do have to end at one but i'm going to get to as many as uh we can this is great um what grade of beef do you use and does it make a difference i want both of you to answer this wayne do you want to go we use Creekstone Choice, and Creekstone Choice is like pretty much everybody else's prime. Um, and we have a really close relationship with them. We'll call the CEO when we need to <laughs> and get Chelsea in trouble. Um, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, good. Lane uh, or Joe? So we use 44 Farm. Uh, it's upper two-thirds choice, and every once in a while we get prime from them, but their upper two-thirds choice is prime. Um, and I just tell people the higher the grade is, the, it just look at it as insurance. It's uh, less room to screw up your brisket because it has all that uh, beautiful marbling inside of it. Mm -hmm. You know, um, Texas A&M has a bunch of barbecue camps um, that they do with Foodways Texas, and it's really hard to get a seat. So I'm not here to say that you should just like sign up tomorrow. It's, it's a lottery system and it's a whole thing. But if you can get in, like I have twice now, um, it is a really special experience and um, I'm sure one or both of you guys have been either, you know, to eat or to present or both. Um, it's a, if you're into Texas barbecue, it's one of the best ways to get deep into Texas barbecue. Um, but I did a blind tasting at one of them where they, um, they smoked different um, grades of brisket on, and they made sure that the, 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 um, that the conditions were otherwise exactly the same so that, you know, cause there's always some variables here and you don't want to get thrown off. And my husband and I um, both liked the highest cut of beef blindfolded. So we were like, gosh, darn it. It's, it's worth paying the extra, at least in our house. Cause we thought we could tell the difference. So I'm usually not a fan of buying the highest priced anything in life. Um, but that was one of those <laughs> unfortunate outliers for our family. Cause now we're always looking for the expensive brisket. <laughs> Makes a difference. <clears throat> okay, other than brisket and ribs, what are your favorite beef cuts for smoking? Joe? Um, beef cheek. Uh, we do beef cheek. Uh, and then mm -hmm. I've been on a kick the last like month. Uh, every Saturday morning, I make me three uh, beef cheek tacos with some pico de gallo and green sauce. It's a good way to start a Saturday. Sure sounds like it. You should come and cook at the rest of our homes. <laughs> Lane? Um, off the top of my head, I can't think of what other beef cuts 
besides like short ribs, but we've been playing around doing like a Kansas City brisket, so that's fun. Like we'll separate the point and the flat and we'll cook the flat all the way to tenderness. And then the point will cook that till it's tender, rest it down, slice it up and put some sauce on there and cook it again. So that's been really fun messing around with. Um, well, let me go back. So Kansas City brisket refers to both the way you trim it and then the sauce thing at the end. I think some people like keep it whole and then separate it after it's cooked. Um, okay. I like to separate them both at the same time. That way I can get more rub on there and get more smoke. Um, but as far as like, I think they put like a little bit of different seasonings and then they do like hickory wood, but it's been okay. something I've been around with. Uh, fun. This is, reminds me of when like Rhode Island style pizza showed up in Dallas and we were like, <laughs> hold the phone. What is that? Yeah. Like Kansas City style brisket. I'm sure people in Kansas City are rolling their eyes at me. Although I did go to school there and I don't remember this. <laughs> um, now, now I need to know more about that and more about people here trying, you know, their style of brisket here that I love that. I think um, that's like some inside City. baseball right there. I'm oh, sorry. On Kansas City, they like run it over a meat slicer. I can't get myself to do that yet, but we've uh -huh. been slicing it like normal. But it's been tasting really good. We've been messing around with like pork ribs and whatnot too. Fun. Wait, so after the brisket is cooked, they hold it in like the deli slicer and like get you these? Yeah. Or oh, I don't like that. Hungry. Yeah. They know the better. Oh my. Okay. Hmm. Okay. Good I to know. I think they take it as far to tenderness as people do in Texas. So that way you can run it on the deli slicer. That makes sense. Yeah. So it's a little firmer and easier to run by that blade. Okay. That makes sense. Um, I'll say this just one more time for anybody just joining us. We are taking final questions in the chat on Zoom. Or if you're on Facebook, we can move those over. Or if you're listening after this, um, stay tuned because people are going to ask cool stuff, even though you can't. And we're glad you're here. Um, what do people eat at your restaurants, guys, when they are vegetarian? Um, our jalapeno cheese hominy or a spicy coleslaw with the tortilla. I think that's the only stuff that we have. The banana mm -hmm. pudding. Lane? All of our sides except the beans and uh, hash are vegetarian. Um, oh, okay. Yeah. And so what are some of those sides? Uh, so we do a coleslaw, potato salad, grits, pudding, bread pudding on Sundays, and then bread, pickles, onions. Yeah. yeah, if we had like more people asking for it, we would do a smoked vegetarian option. I just think out here it'd be like maybe one out of like a hundred people, maybe. You'd need to get on some kind of message board and say like today I'm smoking cauliflower or whatever mm -hmm. it is that you smoke and then have a bunch of people show up because I'm, I'm with you. You don't want to go through that process and maybe even not do it as well as you know you can do something else we want, we you know and have people not show up at Mickle back in the day and that was really good mm -hmm. um, and then at Friedman's we used to do like smoked beets and that was really good too totally that sounds fun too yeah that's that's a that's a cool idea um uh, Joe I want to go back to hominy for a second tell me why you cook hominy and why you like it so growing up my I was always hungry my mom was like just open a can of hominy, put some butter in there, and put it in the microwave, and then yeah. salt, and that's what we ate. So as you know, our restaurant's really small, so we have to do everything in the smoker. So we're like thinking of sides. <clears throat> These makes everything better. Throw some jalapeno, and we'll just smoke it. And it came out good, and people love it. People think it's mac and cheese all the time. We're like, no, it's hominy. And do you do mac too, Joe, or is that your mac replacement? That's our mac replacement. Aha, that's major. Um, OK, <clears throat> do you guys do hominy, Lane? No, no hominy. Okay. It's uh, it's not everywhere, but it, it's sort of a fascinating thing to me. Um, <laughs> okay. Uh, when you're not at a restaurant, guys, where do you like to eat? So this, or when you're not at your restaurant. So this can be another restaurant that's barbecue, a place that's not barbecue at all. Um, just sort of gives a glimpse into what eating is like when you're you. Um. Joe? My happy place is Uchi. That's uh, where yeah. we try to go. Uh, the Beverly Dallas, absolutely love that. Um, and the Meridian, those are like my three right now. Aha. Okay, so for anybody listening, let's break those apart. Uchi is a Japanese restaurant in Uptown. It originated in Austin um, by a Texas chef and has grown to other Texas cities, including Dallas. Um, Beverly's is on Fitzhugh Avenue in Dallas and is a um, an American restaurant that has a little bit of Jewish uh, New York Jewish style inspiration, which is very cool. You can find a couple dishes there that you can't find elsewhere. 
the atmosphere in there is really lively. And then Meridian is a Brazilian American restaurant just off of 75 and uh, mm, Caruth Haven, just north of Mockingbird. Yeah, good ones. Um, and sort of a higher end. It sounds like those are date night spots for you, Joe, and your wife? Yes. Yeah, love it. Well, time. you got kids, you got to get out of the house and do cool stuff like that. Yep. Uh, Lane, where do you like? I think my favorite restaurant in Dallas is probably Cry Wolf. Um, uh -huh. I like, uh, I went to Fatouche, if I'm saying it right, yesterday. It's like Mediterranean Iraqi style. It's really, really good. Yeah. Uh, I like barbecue. And then um, I went to Slow Bone yesterday. That was really Ooh, yeah. good. Shop. Barbecue guy eating somebody else's barbecue. I like that. Um, so Slow Bone is in the design district for anybody listening. Been there for a little while. In addition to being known for its barbecue, they make pretty damn good fried chicken. Uh, a lot of people talk about that. Um, the place also seems really accessible, right? Like line is not super long, but food is always good. Uh, that's Slow Bone. Lane, tell us about Barb's BQ. So that's uh, one of the pit masters. Her name's Chuck. Uh, she does a lot of Goldies. Um, and she's working on opening a spot out in Lockhart. She maybe has a building. I'm not sure if she's working on it, but uh, so hopefully like sometime this year, she hopefully will be open. Yeah, she is a fun, Chuck is a fun follow on um, Instagram, Barb's, B-A-R-B-S-B-Q, I think. Um, and uh, that collaboration was cool to see Lane when Chuck started cooking with y'all, but I know, you know, has plans to do something in, you know, the Texas barbecue Mecca of Lockhart. Um, <clears throat> and then you mentioned Cry Wolf in East Dallas, which is a newish, newish kind of esoteric uh, restaurant with a really fun chef's counter. Um, and what's, oh, Fatouche, you said, um, in Dallas, where is that? I want to, I know that well, people listening are actually well, maybe going to go to some of these places. It's in Arlington, kind of like maybe Pantigo. Uh, mm -hmm. yeah. Okay, cool. It's yeah, like that's a, Mediterranean Lebanese food, right? Corner of like a strip mall and it's really good. Yeah, fantastic. Um, okay, last thing. This is the last question for you guys. And thank you so much for everybody listening. We had dozens of questions, really good ones and hilarious comments on why I'm drinking, not drinking beer during our conversation and free brisket cheesecake for anybody um, playing along in Frisco. Um, the, the last question is, if you could just give one tip to somebody ordering at a barbecue place, you know, maybe the best thing to order or how to order um, or cues on the menu or something that will help them make good choices. What, what are your ordering tips? Joe? Yeah, you know, that's the thing that we try to tell people all the time uh, is we ask them questions like we can help guide you. Like, like as we're asking you questions, like give us like what you're really thinking about so we can guide you what you want. But, you know, always tell people a half a pound total meat is probably all you need for an individual and mm -hmm. you know, barbecue joints they weigh it out so if you really wanted to you can ask for one slice of everything and you get to try everything so it's totally fine you don't have to order a half a pound or a pound of each meat mm -hmm. and what i'm hearing too joe is that it's like totally cool to go up to the counter and like ask a few questions before you order even though there are 18 people behind you who have their thing written on their phone and are ready the second it's okay to talk for 30 seconds. Yeah, you know, we give out samples all the time. Like, you know, like we were really proud of our turkey, but we don't have turkey anymore. We're like, hey, we'll throw an extra slice on there. We'll give you samples so you can try it out. Um, yeah. Okay, maybe don't be worried to ask for a sample either. Like, I want all this stuff. Can I just try one burnt end? Or can I, can I try a little turkey? And then, oh, I love that. I'm going to get some. Turkey was a bad example. Don't love it because you can't get some. Yeah. <laughs> As we just learned today. Oh, um, Lane, what suggestions do you have? Um, I would say ask as many questions. Usually somebody comes by when you're in line and they'll kind of guide you through anything. And I would say like, don't over order it unless you come with a big group, like get a little bit of everything and that way you can try it all and see what your favorites are for next time you come. Um, I like trying everything when I go to places and I think the best way to enjoy Goldie's is trying a little bit of everything, honestly. Um, yeah, mm -hmm. something like that. Chelsea, do you have any tips as a probably avid barbecue eater? um order the chelsea grits at goldie's mm -hmm. those are my favorite are they named for you and i'm really excited about zavala's bringing back fajita night i have favorites at, at all of my customers but those two between goldie's and zavala's are my favorite 
Chelsea never comes to eat at Goldie's. I was here like two weeks ago. She never comes to Zavala's either. Just yeah. to <laughs> <laughs> Chelsea, you got some eating to do. Yeah, I do she plenty. Does. I do she plenty. Does. I assure you. <laughs> Well, thank you, everybody. This has been such a treat. We have Chelsea from Benny Keith, who popped in and had no idea she was going to be on this call today. We have yeah. Lane Milne, who's one of five owners of Goldie's Barbecue in Fort Worth. And we have Joe Zavala, the co-owner of Zavala's Barbecue in Grand Prairie. I'm Sarah Blaskovich, the food writer for the Dallas Morning News. We will have more of these. Barbecue happens to be a passion point of mine, so I'm always pushing that we should talk about barbecue. Um, but we talk about all kinds of things on dallasnews.com slash food. And we also have a new podcast called Eat, Drink, DFW, and we will be pulling pieces of this and using it on our podcast. Uh, we'll be talking about the state fair soon. We will be talking about Halloween. We'll be talking about crappy candy at Halloween. We'll also be talking about haunted restaurants. Um, we are talking about tailgating soon, which is a passion of mine, um, and so many other topics. So I hope everybody will listen to our podcast too, because it's a good way to kind of get in the minds of us and the people we get to talk to like Lane and Joe every day. So Thank you again. This is so much fun. Um, and I didn't eat during this, so I'm starving now. I hope we made everybody else hung hungry for more. And y'all have a great day. Thank you. Thank you.